All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the experience. It's been a while since I've had an interview and I'm so excited to meet and learn more about Holly Copeland and her um, her PR team reached out to me and um, mentioned this in the heading and it was very intriguing, uniting ancient, ancient wisdom with modern science. And as and, you know, anyone who follows my show knows that I used to be an archaeologist. And so, of course, ancient wisdom and spiritual science and all that yummy stuff like Holly, welcome to the show. Let's hear more about it. Hey, Nora, I am so excited to be here and meet you and your audience. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, welcome. Welcome. Me. Yeah, thank you. Um, go ancient wisdom with modern science. There are so many directions I can take that. The first I'll say is that um, my origin story also includes being a scientist. So I was a, a um, GIS specialist and scientist, conservation scientist for the Nature Conservancy and then for University of Wyoming. So I did that science work world for about 30 years. Wow. And, until my life took a giant, you know, 90 degree turn about four years ago. Oh, I got to hear this. Yeah. Yeah. What happened well, four years well, ago? Four years ago, I was feeling pretty burnt out and I was feeling pretty um, upset about the state of the world. And I was feeling like there would never be enough time, money or resources to quote unquote, save the planet. It was like, I'd been doing my part and I had felt like it, you know, it's like, it's okay. It's I'm doing my part. Everybody's doing their part, but it felt like we are not going to get there in this linear world. And it just was starting to feel not right as much as I wanted. I had the dream job. I really did and worked with amazing people, but there was some conflict arising in me. And I, the best I can say is it stemmed from a feeling of deep despair over the planet and sadness and feeling like it wasn't enough. Mm. And so you're, also you're talking about the, the point of view of, um, you know, doing your work with the earth as um a mapper a scientist a person who's in so you're in the earth like help people understand too what what does that work entail i am in the earth so i am thank you for asking that question um i am putting gps collars so i'm putting like radio collars on deer this was the one of the big projects i was involved with and we were tracking migrations of deer in wyoming and across the rocky mountains how do you capture a deer how do you do that oh my god you really want to know yeah. so yeah so you ask great questions nobody's asked me this before but i'm so delighted that you asked me so this is wild so what they do is this team from California and they're they're um they're called muggers these folks from New Zealand that are on helicopters and they literally fly next to the fly like low along the ground till they find a herd of deer and then they have the door open to the helicopter and they shoot a net gun uh, they from a net gun they shoot a big net and it goes over the deer and then the guy jumps out of the helicopter they don't even land he like jumps out so of he, the he he nets the entire or they no. net not just a few they try to like get one off yeah uh -huh. off the side and then they net just the one and then he jumps out of the helicopter and like mugs it to the ground what a stunt man or <laughs> person i mean that's that is like it's like that's the reason people don't know. I mean, people don't know what like archaeologists do. And so that's why I'm like, we got to talk about this. I didn't know you did that. Yeah, that's what. So I didn't do the on the helicopter. Let's be clear. Those were the guys that were working for us, for my the team that I was working with. And then we would they 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 get the deer and they wrap them they they tie their hooves together and they put a blindfold on them and then then this is the crazy part too. Then they bring them to us. We're like at a central location waiting already for the deer. And they like hanging upside down underneath the helicopter, transporting like over, I almost oh. want to show you a picture. Like, <laughs> they fly into us and there's- That has to be the crazy. That's like an, it's like an alien abduction Completely. for the deer. That completely that's what it's like for them I mean it actually makes me feel sad and there was some sadness for me doing this work too um 
that was weighing on me as well. But they then dropped the deer very, very gently. I mean, everybody loves the deer and the elk and the were the animals we're working with, right? So we're we're trying to be as very gentle as we can. Right. And Wait, we take the deer, we bring them in, we weigh them, we take measurements, we draw blood, we take poop, and we do all the things. And then we put a, a collar on them. And the gist of the work that I was doing was with these collars, we can track where they go. Mm-hmm. And through this work, for example, um, they tracked a deer named, they actually named it Jet. And they discovered that she made the longest overland migration um, in in the United States, in the lower 48. She travels like 100 and, 148 miles one way. Wow. Every, from southern Wyoming up into Idaho and back. And she wow. does this every single, and these herds do this every single, they do it twice a year, basically, because they go up in the, you know, up in the spring and back in the fall. So they're making this, you know, 150, 180 mile migration. And what we were trying to do with this work was to look at the places where the deer might intersect humans. So for example, subdivisions or highway crossings, and then Mm -hmm. try to intervene with conservation work to, you know, so they don't get killed on the highways basically, mm-hmm, or so that mm-hmm. they don't put a subdivision right in the middle of their migration. Because one of the things we learned is that they have high fidelity, mm-hmm. meaning that they, once they establish a route that they learn from their mother, that's the route they take. And they take mm-hmm. it every single year. And they even, deer are amazing. They follow that migration in some places within feet every single year. They go back and forth on the same trail, walking the same path. Wow. So the you know so the the flip side of feeling bad about causing the alien induction alien abduction is that you know hundreds of deer are making a particular route and if we can intervene from a conservation point of view we can ensure that that route stays intact and the deer can continue to do their migrations even as humanity continues to do its thing mm. so that was, that's an example of the work i was doing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So fascinating. It's so, it's so cool to just know that that is going out there. And I can totally relate to the idea that being in that line of work, you're like, I'm doing something for the planet, but then you're also like, but what am I like, what's actually changing things? So fast forward to four years ago and what happened? Yeah. So I was just I was feeling like what I described is just this kind of existential sadness about that, you know, despite our best efforts, humanity's march on the planet is just not going to, is is just going to be more than we can do from a conservation point of view. Mm. So it was feeling like a, like a lose, like losing game, a losing battle sort of. I guess would be the way to describe it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was weighing on my heart and I was just feeling a lot of sadness and feeling, and then looking around at my life and looking around at like, dang it, I've got, you know, two beautiful children and a, you know, and a beautiful husband. And I'm in this house in Wyoming. I'm like by living the dream life by every single way you could measure it. And yet I'm still not happy. Like there's this unsettled sadness deep within me. And if I can't be happy amidst all of what I've done, I'm never going to be happy. Like this Mm -hmm. is ridiculous, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I guess I went on search of deep happiness of like, how do I really find that? Because I'm not, I've, I've checked all the boxes, right? Nobody, where's the fulfillment? Where to go? What I've done done all the things and where's the fulfillment? Yeah. 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 And it's like, you know, I think most, I certainly did. And I think a lot of people seems like this is the trap of the twenties and thirties. We like are so driven that if we just do the things, Mm -hmm. then we'll be happy that we just go on autopilot to do those things. And, (laughs) and oh, that autopilot. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) And then you wake up in your mid forties and you go, wait a minute. (laughs) <laughs> like I, well, what and I don't know if you know this about my work. I'm a, I'm a hypnotherapist. Okay. So yeah. So working with autopilot is all about, you know, what 
I'm interested in because it's, it's like, how do we live our life consciously? You know, how do we do that? How do we bring humanity from this autopilot place? Cause I think that's a part of the sort of historic record of, uh, well, what's existed in uh, industrialization, which is like, you get, you do your work, you, you know, you do all the things you have your kids, you have your partner, you do your work, and then you somehow arrive at this place at this intersection of fulfillment and happiness. And it's like, uh, and then you've arrived and it's like, people are like, wait, where is it? How did it, <laughs> how did this, you know, not drop into my lap? It's I'm waiting. Right. Where is it? Exactly. Exactly. And I stood there at 45 and I went, where is it? And I'm like, okay, I got to find it. I got to, I can't go any longer this way. And I kind of like a good scientist. <laughs> it was <laughs> like, well, my brain feels like a mess because I feel like there's this narrator in my head running the show. And I don't know who this person is. And I've they're got, very opinionated. They're so, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they have lots of them. They're very judgmental. They're very critical. Yeah, exactly. I'm like curious about this person. And so I start to read books like um, Les Fermi's uh, Open Focus Brain because I want to quiet oh, my mind. Uh -huh, I was like, uh -huh. I got to quiet my mind, right? I didn't realize at the time that meditation isn't fundamentally about quieting the mind. But that's in my naivete. That's what I did. So sure, you know, I start. It's an exploration. I, yeah, you start from like, somewhere. Yeah, I start from somewhere. I go to a meditation retreat and get my, you know, get sort of kicked, to kick down, <laughs> kicked down. Kicked. It goes so from out. like nothing to a meditation retreat. I mean, that's it's intense. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I remember there was this guy there. <laughs> it was. I'm like, he was a helper, right? I'm like, well, what are you doing here? He's like, well, I'm on meditation for for the month. I'm like, you're doing this for a month? <laughs> said, yeah. I mean, e every day? He said, yeah. I said, you sit in silence meditating every day for eight plus hours? He said, yeah. And I just like my jaw dropped on the floor. I'm like, oh my God. I Have can't. you found fulfillment? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did it drop in for you? Because that's not, that's not very, that's, that's kind of scary. Yeah. But what I did notice was that the people, the teachers that were teaching the meditation retreat had this etheric calm about them mm. that I recognized I didn't have. Like they, they exuded this essential peace and calmness about everything mm. that I didn't feel. And I was like, I want that. Whatever you've got there, that's, that's what I want. I want some. I want some, please. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I continued meditating. I met another meditation teacher, a couple teachers. I did a class with them and ended up there. They teach subtle energy meditation. And I ended up studying with them. One, one of them is still my primary teacher. We meet every week. And it was like, I took the freaking red pill of, you know, I was in the matrix and I took the red pill and I just dove into consciousness, um, plant medicine. Um, I did all the things, you oh, know, cool. And That's cool. That's a cool thing to talk about too. Cause it's so, it's so prevalent right now is, is, you know, just sort of expanding consciousness through plant medicine. Yeah. yeah. You did all the things. I did all the things. What was your husband like? what's yeah. going on? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Um, he's bless his heart. He's a beautiful man. Um, we are no longer married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that sort of gives you an insight into yeah, that. Like I, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, it, it's miraculous when it works out and, um, yeah, these yeah. are big soul changes, these paradigm shifts that, that happen and that can have a huge impact on relationships. I mean, it, it has to, it has to, it has to. And bless his heart. He's a scientist, like a hardcore scientist with a hardcore, you know, materialist scientific, scientific view of the world. And mm -hmm. my ancient wisdom kind of went straight up against that and blew my world apart. And, and was he an know, atheist? Just, yeah, more or less. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's my reality is a quantum reality. It's not a linear reality. It, it just isn't. And in fact, that's where all my hope and my 
a positivity about the future is like, it's not a linear world, you know, right. so the conservation, it's like, yeah, the external world looks like chaos. It, it does, but we're blowing apart. You know, we are um, evolving at a phenomenal rate inside. And that to me is, it's, you know, epically awesome. The way that we are in each of us, you know, I'm sure people like your listeners listening are transforming radically. We've got, you know, a fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Hopefully I want to hear it. If you no. are, no, that's so good. Yeah. So, well, so, I, so yeah, I want to like, so you, you went into this, this, you dropped in, you dropped into your, your, the intelligence that's flowing through you mm-hmm. and you gain access to what, what happened? What I gained access to was the deepest knowing that there's nothing to fix that I am Mm. whole and every single, the world is whole. Um, There's an innate perfection and intelligence here that we can't mess up as human Mm -hmm. beings. (laughs) Isn't that refreshing? (laughs) God, (laughs) right? Especially right now, like it's a wild, wild time. It is, it is. And, you know, my, I have to say that like, I wrestled with evil and good for, you know, most of my life. I was like, this is my, my sort of existential crisis. It's like the mind can't work out. How can there be so much bad in the world? You know, mm-hmm. whether, you know, you, you could name it, you could sit here and name it forever. Right. It's so observable. There's so much of it. It's so, right. yeah. Right. You know, name your poison, name the thing that breaks your heart. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, for me, elephants in the, what we were doing to elephants was just breaking my heart as one mm. example. Mm. Right. Mm. And so, um, what humans are doing like in Africa. Yeah. 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 Oh. Cutting off your tusks, whatever, Easy right? suffer, suffering vector right there. <laughs> right. So just to point to one example of something that just was breaking my heart. Right. And so how can that exist and how can I be well at the same time? That's yeah. the crisis that mm-hmm, I was coming mm-hmm. up with. This is do good. I, this is important. Right? Yeah. Do I ever have the right to be well and mm-hmm. good and happy and joyful amidst all of the evil that apparently is in the outside world? It it was, I mean, that that's the essential crisis, right? That's the, you Absolutely. know, if you, oh, that's the hero's journey. Yeah, change. that's the root cause of so much suffering. So exactly. so how did you navigate that? Yeah, so and I apologize there's there's a mowing behind me hopefully. There's <laughs> always it's not funny. I, I can't hear it. Okay, oh good. Okay. Um so through a number of methods, but the first one was In meditation, where I went was the experience that Buddhists would call of emptiness to, to, um, to merge the separate, you know, to, to see through the illusion of the separate soul, that self, separate soul, that self (laughs) that is suffering, right? Yes. That is the one who itself sees the outside world and goes, oh my God, what chaos. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. But you can't talk your, you know, the mind can't talk itself out of that. Mm -hmm. So it has to be an experiential knowing. It can't be, I read in the book and I make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And I had always, because I was trained as a Western scientist, and I bet you relate to this too. Everything in Western science gets worked out in the mind. So Mm -hmm. I'm trying to like solve the problem of evil, the world's evils through the mind. And you can't, you can't. No. no. It's like an analog, um, an analog or outdated technology that we're sort of forced to work with, you know, and, 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 and it's like the mind's doing its thing. It's working so hard on our behalf to, to come up with these stories. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I like, yes, exactly. It's like antiquated technology. Yeah. <laughs> and what I discovered through meditation and the teachers I worked with was that there's a better technology that we can bring online that is transcends the the limitations of the mind. And it's actually right here. It's never anywhere else, but right here. And it's like, but you have to 
somebody has to show you how to flip the switch. Mm -hmm. Usually some people mm -hmm. arrive yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Eckhart Tolle's of the world kind of have yeah. their own realization. Yeah. But for me, I, I worked in the, worked with these teachers to see and to feel and know for myself to see through the illusion of the separate self. And when I did that, it, it literally changed everything. I mean, it, and one way I describe it is it's like finding the ground <laughs> of being, you mm -hmm. know, and that before then it was like, I was always walking around in the world with no ground, with mm -hmm. no safe Harbor mm. because the world is just a scary place and there's no harbor. There's no place to dock and go like, I'm fine. I wonder you know? what that did to your root chakra, you know, like your, you, you know, like your sense of grounding, your sense of safety. Like, did you, did you have that at yeah. all? Like, was that, was there, cause I, I mean, just in the work that I do uh, often, one of the earliest sort of phases of the work is to discover your safe space and in internal state, like create one and it can change, but there are people who are like, I've never been safe. I don't know what that feels like. Mm, that feels like exactly. Yeah. yeah, totally. So I work with people like you to help people find their safe space, to help people find the ground. Let's it's go, so let's get together and let's find the ground. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know? yeah and, a guide. To, so, so what I hear you saying too, and, and we need a lot of us in the world with different sort of languaging of, of this type, like your way in just like fitness instructors are showing you how to find those little teeny muscles that you didn't even know that you exist. Same thing here. It's like, where is that sort of special, like knocking on the door so that the, you know, that the portal opens up and then the access is granted. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We need a lot of us doing that work. We do. So, yeah. Everybody. Yeah. I mean, look at how many therapists are busy, right? Like therapists are booked. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Far in advance. And, you know, this, this deeper work is, um, is the, I think it's next tier. I mean, a lot of people, I don't know if this happens to you, but people come to me and they're like, okay, well, this is the last resort because, therapy is not working right you know definitely yes I get yeah. get some of that for sure and um and once I found the ground then it opened up into this discovery of also the energetic universe and and the subtle energetic universe so i work with tuning forks with people to oh, release cool. trauma in the field i'm a biofield tuning practitioner and what i have found is that combining the seeing the ground finding the ground with the energetic work is super powerful um and do breath work as well so i kind of use those three or my kind of three pillars mm. and to help people, you know, release trauma in the body, release trauma in the field through the magic of vibration and tuning forks. Cool. And because even when you see there is still, there can still be, you know, the, the vibration in the body. And I, there's various modalities to, to release that, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, plant medicine also was extremely helpful for me in in clearing, you know, it's a process of clearing um, alchemizing the pain into mm -hmm. love mm -hmm. to compassion. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. And I'm, and I'm curious. So, um, what do you mind me asking? What kind of plant medicine was catalytic for you? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So I worked with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. I worked with a shaman in the United States for a while. And then I went down to Costa Rica and did some ceremonies there and then came back and worked with a different shaman, um, here in, on the West coast. So of California. So I've awesome. worked with, yeah, a number of different, um, three different groups. And I've been to some incredibly dark places. I will say that most of my journeys up until, um, the last two that I did were extremely hard. I mean, mm. extremely the hardest nights of my life. Wow. I mean, do you mind saying more about that? Cause I think a lot of people who have never 
journeyed, um, you know, just, it would be great to have more material out there about that. And I've never done ayahuasca. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, so, so one of the parts of my story I didn't tell you about was that I got mold poisoning. And so oh, no, I was, so in this shift that I made, I was one of the things that in addition to the crisis of my heart, I was physically ill. So mm-hmm. I had mold. It took me a long time to find it. I, with the help of functional medicine doctors, I got, I started doing infrared saunas and I started um, doing like charcoal and other things to detox my body. And I started getting well, but it, the whole process took about two years. How, to how did, what, how was the mold showing up in your experience? Um, you mean in my body? Yeah. Like what were the symptoms? Yeah. So I literally woke up one morning and I had edema bags under my eyes. I had red, like redness under my eyes and skin and puffiness. Mm. And it took me over six months to find the mold, uh, which was in my bed, by the way. So for those who, you know, might experience something like this beds, my bed had a, had an air mattress with a foam topper and there was some plastic between those and Mm. years of sleeping on it and all that body heat condensed on the plastic. And so unbeknownst to me, I mean, this is all sewn into the bed. I can't see any of this. Right. 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 But unbeknownst to me, every time I would lay my head on the pillow and, you know, sleep for eight hours, I was getting a giant dose of mold. Whoa. So yeah, it was, and I had no idea. I mean, we, we tore yeah, sure. apart, we tore walls apart. We were like doing all the things to try to find it. Once I discovered that I thought it was mold and the getting a new bed was the last thing I did finally out of desperation, uh, because mm. I read somewhere on the internet that it could be a source of mold. And I just said, I don't know if it is, but let's get a new bed. And sure enough, when we pulled it apart and took it out of the house, we found it. So oh, I was you, like, you found that the mold. <laughs> yeah but what, like a, what a what a yeah to to like uh to finally find the your adversary you know it's like very hard. I'm like oh my god all of this time it was under literally under my nose wow. so and the first time I went to getting back to ayahuasca the first time I went to working with this shaman in the Rockies and she I took Aya and I went up for a healing with her and she put her hand on my head and said some prayers or some, you know, shaman speak. And all of a sudden, like my nose just starts like floodgates open and this snot just starts running down my nose and dripping, you know, on the floor. I was like, whoa, (laughs) this is before you, like just when you had taken it, you know, it took, uh, no, it probably took you know, no, I had taken it like an hour before, right? Oh, okay. And then I go up for a healing, you know. So the so the ayahuasca is well in me and everything. Um what a trip. Like, oh, this shit's for real. Yeah. <laughs> such a trip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. Like all of a sudden you're just purging. And and your sinuses and stuff must have been really needing to clear from is that in sort of yeah. similar time frame as the mold? It is. I was well in the mold trying to heal from the mold and mold, you know, mex- rest- messes with your sinuses. It gets mm-hmm. you know lodged in your sinuses. So mm-hmm. I was purging, literally purging my sinuses. And that whole journey, I don't even know that I threw up. I don't think I did. I just my nose wouldn't stop running. It was wow. like my sinuses were like clearing and clearing and clearing and clearing. Wow. And it was crazy. And when I came back for another ceremony three months later, the shaman, there were two of them. They were like, you look like a different person. Like your wow. eyes are bright, you're clear. You look so different from when you came to us three months ago. Wow. So I, you know, I have such deep respect for ayahuasca as a healing medicine to clear the body. Like she wants a clean house. We say mm-hmm. and she has this incredible power to just go in and find, you know, she starts, it feels to me like she just starts rewiring your body. Mm. Like, like, let's get this shit out of here. You know, <laughs> like, what yeah, let's clear it. Let's clear it. Let's clear it. Wow. That is cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think ayahuasca played a big part in helping me clear physically Mm -hmm. Um, and of course every 
in my world, every physical ailment has a, an emotional component oh, that's right. kind of separate. Mm-hmm. And then we started, you know, the next journeys were all about the sadness that I had in my heart. And it was super painful. There was a lot of throwing up. I had nights in Costa Rica that I don't think I stopped throwing up for, you know, more than 20 minutes. I mean, it was so unbelievably dark and hard. And there were some, Mm. there were some powerful, you know, amazing things like, you know, being on the ground and feeling like I was a, I mean, I remember one time I was like a, like a, some kind of an earthworm or creature. And I was like trying to dig down into the earth and explore these crazy, beautiful experiences, feeling the vibration of love moving through my body, like as a felt sense. Uh Uh Um, But there was just a lot of purging and it was Mm. hard. And, you know, afterwards there were times when I questioned, you know, that morning, like, what am I doing? Right. Like, was this good for me? It's good for me, but we, you know, but then you integrate and you go home and you, you know, you heal. And, And I have to say that, I mean, the sadness that, that I felt it's not here. I've, Mm. I've alchemized it and I wouldn't change anything about what I did because it was well worth it. Like well, well, well worth it. And is this the sadness you were talking about that existential sadness that about the planet? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember one night, I'll give you an example where I just feel horrible about the feedlots and the, in the you know, millions and millions of animals that are slaughtered every day. And I had read some statistic about, I don't know, I don't even remember now, you know, 20 million animals a day on the planet are killed or some, mm. some awful mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. number that's just your mind can't even wrap itself around. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I just remember being this journey and it was like, just, I mean, sobbing and sobbing mm. for, mm. for the animals that we kill every day. Mm. And, you know, there was a helper coming over and I'm like, why are we doing this? And just, you know, floods of tears. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I processed through some really big things that had, you know, torn at my heart and, but yeah, there's, she, she shows you that underneath all of it is love that underneath all of it. That's, that's what's happening. That's what we are. And that we can't, we can't um, mess that up, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, Back to mm-hmm, what I said. Mm-hmm. Like ultimately, we mm-hmm. are love, and I have seen that very clearly in this last ceremony I did. I had the most beautiful experience I, I could ever just I can't words couldn't even begin to describe that knowing of, of the most beautiful love that is the basis of all, of everything, and um, and now that. It's so confidently in my heart. I can't, I can't shake it. It's right. Not, you know, it, it's your, it's a known, it's known element of your, of your experience. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I think it's, you know, it's so, it's so timely in a quantum sense. Um, and yesterday I was thinking about um, suffering and on my way to work, I saw a squirrel that had been hit and not dead yet like flapping flopping around on the road and I was just like oh and and, but the thought that was in my head and I don't remember where it came from but the idea is our suffering like what we're seeing and suffering from externally is a reflection of what we're what suffering what we're suffering from internally like so I just it popped into my head at that moment because I was suffering so much in that moment of seeing that squirrel of my interpretation of their suffering was causing me such deep suffering that mm-hmm. I was just like, it, it almost felt too much to bear. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, and then the thought came and I was like, Oh, oh my gosh, the universe is showing me through that squirrel, what I've been suffering, like just it's showing me my suffering. So it was almost like I was allowing it to, instead of being something that I was projecting my suffering into and interpreting as that, that must be feeling this way. Cause I can't truly know um, to the universe is saying this squirrel is, is representing the suffering that you're carrying right now. Like you, you don't have to suffer. 
you can, you know, like the universe is going to show you what you're, what you're looking for. Basically, like if you're in the vibration of suffering, you're going to be fine. You're going to be seeing it in the world. And, and, and it's, I mean, it's just, to me, it just it seems poignant because I think a lot of people right now are suffering because there are so many things to observe. Like there's so much suffering. Right. There's so much to suffer and focus on um, in the, right. in the midst of where we're at as a, as a world and in, in our, you know, just this current wild time that we're in. And um. I think your message about that every that there's nothing going wrong here. Like everything is, everything's okay. Yeah, everything's okay. Yeah, and what you said about the squirrel is so wise and and on point. And I just want to riff on that a minute because it's so yeah, please. Yeah, so that very much is my experience. Is that when we see something suffering like you did with a squirrel and then you have this recognition that it's it's actually my suffering there's no separation there isn't there isn't a separate suffering in fact everything that's happening our experience in that sense is us yes that is the the message of of the great sages the wisdom traditions is that there is no separation you 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 th- it looks as though there's a separate you and a me, but actually there's, it, it, you know, and I love pointing like a very easy way to point this out is to say, can you find the boundary between you and me? Like if I ask you to find the boundary, right? You can close your eyes and go like, can I find the boundary between Nora and Holly? Like it doesn't exist, right? Same with your squirrel, right? If you, mm-hmm. if you feel into that experience of the squirrel, can you find the boundary between you know, the suffering that you perceived was it's and and you like, no, there's just suffering. So everything is, I had this realization come out to me in a, in a ceremony where it was like, everything is me. Mm-hmm. Actually, mm-hmm. everything is me. And yeah. actually, paradoxically, nothing is me. Both. Right. Things. Right. Yeah. Well, and because- just think how many people would just like trip to know that they're Donald Trump. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Everything is me. That means well, they're the war in Ukraine. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so then what you do when you have that, so when you feel the suffering of the squirrel or <laughs> the absurdity of Donald Trump or, you know, your anger that arises from that is rather than to be, to look to, if Donald Trump didn't exist, then I wouldn't feel anger. That's the old way. The new Mm -hmm. way is to pause, feel the anger arising in you as yours and say, that's mine. I take ownership. I'm not going to blame Donald Trump for making me angry. I'm actually going to own it and feel the feeling of anger arising in me. Mm -hmm. Just sit with it. And it will actually, it, it can't it'll do what it does. It, it'll yeah. move through. Yeah. Feel the feeling, drop the story, you know, Pema children, you know, let the feeling move through you, let it. And ultimately, as we do that practice of kind of release you know, of being with our own suffering as, mm-hmm. and claiming it, taking, you know, reclaiming it as ours, we alchemize it. We, we actually come home to ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. We give ourselves the permission to just, to love, to love the anger, to, you know, to claim it. And um, over time, that will, what in my experience, what happens is anger doesn't arise anymore. It just mm. arises as compassion. Mm. Wow. Just, I just feel compassion when I see mm. those things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, and my heroes are people like the Dalai Lama. You know, you look at him and that's like, think of the suffering that he's witnessed for his own country, right? Mm. But yet there's this smiling, knowing in his eyes and what he exudes is compassion. We, we, you know, we look to him and because he's like, everything is okay. And let me show you, mm. it's okay, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and what I find in my own experience from that sense of 
okayness, which is really what is the gut of this is like, there's, I am fundamentally well, you are fundamentally well, you fundamentally don't need to be fixed. Nobody listening here needs to be fixed. You are well as you are. And when we step into that new reality and we really claim our whole selves, then we step into possibility for whatever we want to co-create with the universe. Mm -hmm. So then you move into the world in this empowered way of being where you get to like, what am, what am I, you know, what does the universe want to do through me? You know, how do I want to show up? How do I want to contribute? And it's like showing up in a whole new way because you're not broken. You yeah. just show up, you know? I love it. I love it. And I, and it, it, to me, like what I would, what I would call that is you, your soul gets to be involved in this, in this experience here on earth. Like you no longer, because when you connect with those awarenesses and you're able to sit with them, you're also activating what I would call this deep technology within your human, this latent technology of the felt experience and that intelligence that comes through our felt knowing, you know? And so we become these, these activated, you know, super capable beings where we can, where we are more mystical and magical and quantum. And so what reality, you know, that linear reality is just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i love it activating the deep technology we have so yeah. much re- i you know speak in that language often too so we have so much resonance and it's like right when you activate that deep technology you become a superhero yeah you literally yeah. Become superhero. and that's what we came here to to do it okay. you know yes we knew that it was going to be hard yes we knew that it, there was going to be trickiness but we also knew that we were going to be able to have fun with it, or we wanted to anyway, that it was going to be playful for us. And human beings have gotten into a place where we've forgotten and that's okay. We get to remember now if we want. And so those are the people that come to see you. Those are the people that come to see me, or those are the people who are looking for this material out here, which is the whole reason I do this show. It's like, I get to have these conversations. You get to have these conversations. And if our delicious, yummy conversation can have, you know, energetic tendrils that are out there for people to go, oh, that's what I'm going through. This, this thing that you're talking about, this is that thing. This is that thing, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I have to say, like in my own journey, I was... I was listening to things like practically 24 seven when I wasn't sleeping, I would be listening to all these different teachers. You weren't sleeping? No, I was sleeping. uh, Well, some of that too. But you know, when I was waking awake, I was just eating this stuff up. Just like I couldn't get enough of it, of hearing different teachers and different perspectives. And they were all saying the same thing. They were all pointing to it, but it, you know, it it works its way into you. You, you, the more you, you know, I think you can have the recognition, but then it's about the practice of it. It's about using every experience in your life as an opportunity to practice this. So, you know, the, you know, whether it's the kind of proverbial person cuts you off or steps in front of you in line and you, you have a reaction of anger, like that's your moment. Mm -hmm. That's your moment to reclaim it and go like, okay, oh, that's mine. That's yeah. Not, it's mine. And, and to really feel into it, really let it, you know, like step uh, into it. Well, and I think it's an, it's interesting, right? Like I think, and, and practitioners get to contemplate this with one another and, and you and I can sort of talk in this space of like, how do you like, you know, people have their different, like these opportunities arise. And so when like you had these you had a, a, like a ca- catalytic sort of time frame where, you know, I would call this like a spiritual awakening where something inside of you is needing to shift. And and yes, people are going through spiritual awakenings in, in different ways. I had a client uh, relatively recently who called me up and she was like, I'm, you're, you're going to think I'm crazy. Um, I'm a scientist 
and she works for a pharmaceutical company and she um, started being like given like in the midst of somebody's death experience like where all of a sudden she's that person who's either dying of suicide or of murder and all like all of a sudden she's in that experience like her consciousness is their consciousness and it was scaring the daylights out of her of course um and her husband um couldn't handle it hardcore uh catholic and um she was coming into her spiritual awakening and um, and what it turned out is the reason these souls were coming to her is they were neat, just they were just simply needing to be crossed over. She didn't she didn't know that. And so it was very traumatic and scary for her. Um, and and what's more is she's not even awakening just for herself. It's very clear through the guidance of her session work is she's doing this for her daughter, who is a very, very gifted spiritual mm -hmm. child. And, mm -hmm. and so these are, these are these catalytic moments that I'm talking about and, and, and people are having them more and more. And I'm wondering, do people come to you when they're having these moments? Yeah. Yeah. Um, people are at all different stages that come to me. So, um, sure. I'm, I'm, you know, having, I haven't had anything quite quite like that, but I've certainly been in circles where people are, you know, in, in other communities are cracking that, open a really wild way. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not, I'm it's not saying that it's, it's all over the like place. that. Yeah. That's the most wild one I've ever encountered for sure. Yeah. But it's, it's amazing how, how many people are opening in these kind of wild, wild ways. Um, <laughs> There, you know, where we're connecting essentially in the quantum field with, you know, different dimensions, different aspects of so-called reality, different dimensions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think people's souls, you know, do it. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dr. Michael Newton. Um, but, you know, when, when I work with a client on a soul level, their soul has a sense of what they want to be happening. And there can be sort of a blueprint or a, a rough sketch of what it is and what time frame things should be moving. Like if you're going to stay with your blinders on, then there's going to be this moment and you'll have an opportunity there. And then there's going to be this moment. There's going to be an opportunity there. And there are these big moments. And I don't think that that's always the case. Sometimes it's just the activation of whatever it is that they've decided to focus on that it's, it's the quantum experience that's like okay this makes sense for your consciousness to awaken right here like now you're going to have a kundalini awakening or, or whatever it is or you're going to have an ayahuasca ceremony or whatever um but people are cracking open and they're or you know maybe it's a near-death experience you know and people yeah. are like okay you know wtf what do i do and i yeah. know when i encounter these people it is so very common that they're like, I have no one to talk to. Yeah. yeah. And I can't, I can't tell my family. I can't tell my partner. I can't. And what's interesting about that, and this is just my theory, my belief is, and I could be wrong, that you can tell more people than you think. Because so many people have had these experiences, but then they keep them close to the vest because they're afraid that people are going to think that they're crazy. I guess, you know, as a kid, I, I never fit in. Like I always, people always thought I was weird and crazy. So I never like had that problem <laughs> of fitting in. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But people do, they like, like, I'm like, I'm not that person. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> you might be. Right. Absolutely. You know, and I think one of the things you're speaking to what's coming up for me is the paradigm that we have the hypnosis as it were that we've been living under for the last 200 years that it's a dead inert universe with stuff called matter that's dead and inert and there's a thing called consciousness that arises in your brain magically somehow <laughs> none of which is true inexplicably <laughs> inexplicably somehow just, in, this, in this sort of know. unit somehow yeah yeah i mean it makes no sense because our experience is actually that consciousness is unbound and unlimited. You know, when we reach out into the world with consciousness, there's no limit 
to consciousness. Oh, that's just chemical reactions. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think we're in a, in a, in a huge paradigm shift where we will see that actually it's a conscious universe. And as, you know, David Boehm, you know, talked about early on, you know, the unfolding intricate order. Um, I don't know that guy, but sounds great. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. He's amazing. He was a physicist way ahead of his time in the 1950s. And he uh, proposed a theory of the implicate order where reality is this in there's a there's a web or a net and uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, interconnected reality that's unfolding in in all the ways that we see mm. and but it's at its basis it's it's alive right it's mm. intelligent and alive mm. and you know um western science isn't quite there yet but I think we are turning and I think mm -hmm. it's not long before that, that, that all the holes that have been poked in that, that just don't line up with people's experience, whether it's, you know, near death experiences or, you know, cycle, you know, various ways that people are telepathically connecting or spoon bending or, I mean, mm -hmm. all these mm -hmm. different ways. Yeah. That like the inner senses are awakening and people, people are noticing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that it's just a matter of time before it will, you know, the cat will be out of the bag and will recognize that that material universe, it, just that, that way of looking in the world doesn't, doesn't hold up anymore. Yeah. And just the word inert is so, it's like, it's so visceral. It's, it feels so sterile and untrue, you know, like nothing could be farther from the truth. True. Right. Nothing. It's, I mean, yeah. it, an inert, what? Yeah. I mean, and consciousness is non-local. How about that? Like, how about we're receiving and transmitting consciousness always, you know, always, like, always. I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun. And it's, it's also just curious. I mean, to me, it's like, okay, so at some point the pharmaceutical industry will have to make sense of profit through wellness. They will just like, doesn't it seem like a better model? Yeah. <laughs> it's scratching. I know. <laughs> I know. It, they're at some point they are they're going to have to. And um yeah, I mean, I get proven about the non-local universe every day when I work on biofield tuning with people across the world. You know, I put my tuning forks into the field of somebody in Australia. Yeah. You know? Oh, totally. Or a cat in Australia. I did a cat a few weeks ago who was ill and you know, got up from the table and took a poop and the owner was thrilled because this cat was, you know, having issues. And I mean, it's crazy, but it, you know, like it's my first person experience and I do it every day over and over again. And it's proven that it, that it works and I other love people it. are having these, you know, non-local experiences. And, and I, I think you're right. I think there are kind of getting back to where you started with this, that we think that, you know, people will think we're crazy, but when you kind of get in there and you, you know, <laughs> really talk to people in an intimate setting, you find out that their real views are probably much more broader and more oh, yeah. than you think they are. Yeah. Yeah. And they're just afraid of being judged, many of right. them, but they've also not given themselves permission to, to their throat chakra to <laughs> express you know, yeah. they haven't given themselves permission. And so in some ways they don't even know how it all connects, but they're, they just know that there's a resonance to what you're saying and they can't articulate why, you right. know, and right. that's, it, it rings true. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's like, what, this is actually so much easier than living the way that I've been living. You know, yeah. it's like, well, so that's good news, right? Like, don't you want your vital life force energy to be aligned with the way that you're living so that you can really do the things that you came here to do, as opposed to like leaking your energy just at, in these inefficiencies of just trying to keep up this facade or like, right. tr you know, trying to fit it into this very bizarre reality that society is saying it should look like this and then it's like oh let's let's scoop another level of like 
bizarreness and say, you know, and then this too, like, and, and come up with these really bizarre narratives and say, now figure out how to make that work. And it's like, you just clear that shit, you know, <laughs> and you're going to have so much more energy to like live the life that you're meant to live. Absolutely. I can't believe how much energy I have. I mean, I don't get tired in the afternoon anymore. That's I go, awesome. Like I go to bed at 10, 30 or 11, like, and I just fall asleep like that. And this, it did not used to be that way. You know, I was working and then I get tired and exhausted and have to take a nap. But like you're saying, when you align with the universal life force, it's self-powered, self-generating, and it will move through you and move you through life Mm. in an effortless kind of way. It really is like that, like the Mm. old way that we have to do work Mm -hmm. in order to um, get things done is, is not the only model out there. And I'm not saying, true. you know, it's not like I do dishes. I do my own thing. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I do the my stuff house. you got to do, <laughs> do the things I have to do. So this is the part that the mind goes, what do you mean? Don't do work. But it's like, it feels effortless because you're mm-hmm. not resisting what's happening. And when you stop resisting life and you start letting it flow through you, you just stop and you you just don't say no. You just start saying yes to life and it moves through you and it's self-powered. And, you know, I'm still doing the dishes, but I'm not waiting for anything to happen. They're just sort of doing, I'm just, you're just in it, just in it. Yeah. It's just a different way of being altogether. Well, Holly Copeland, I appreciate you being on the show. Um, I love what you're saying. And I really want people to know how to access your services because they're going to want that energy you're talking about. Yeah. So uh, how, how can people work with you? Yeah. Thanks, Nora. So my website is heartmindalchemy.com. And there's a couple different ways to work with me. I'm starting new monthly groups starting this month. We meet twice a month and it's just $44 a month and you get if this really resonates with you and you want to join a community of people that I'll be doing biofield tuning, I'll be leading meditations and doing breath work, um, 90 minutes, two times a month, you please awesome. come join my heart mind circle. And then I do one-on-one coaching, mentoring, um, biofield tuning, breath work. And, um, yeah. And there's also a, a course that's uh, an evergreen course online. So those are some things you can find on my website. If you would like Fantastic. to start with. Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'd love to have you on the show again. And I have to hop off because I have a client I need to call, but yep. um, I will put all of that information. If you have anything else that you want me to put in the, um, in the description, just let me know and I'll put it in and I'll send this to you when it's all said and done. But until then, thank you so much for joining me on the show and getting your energy out in the world. And um, great to know that you're out there. So nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too, Nora. Thanks so much for having me on.